to see you all here today. We have a few announcements as we get started. I wanted to mention that uh, uh, Pastor Frederica has a pretty good cough and so is staying at home today in this season of being conscientious about our coughs and whatnot. Um, and I wanted to make a couple of announcements related to that as far as the service goes today. We're going to take a Lenten discipline of not passing the offering plates um, down each and every aisle for every last person to touch. Um, don't get too excited. There still will be an offering. So uh, the, the plate is in the center aisle here. And so uh, please, on your way out or as you come forward uh, for communion, please make sure you stop there during that season. Um, one other thing that I wanted to mention, and um, I'm just 
really trying to move Lutheran into the cool category. And the way we're gonna do that during this season as well is to normalize the use of an elbow bump instead of a handshake. So um, as I have been communicating with doctors in the congregation and whatnot, these seem like simple steps that we can take um, during this uh, season. And so um, you're welcome to laugh at the same time if you would like to, but uh, that is uh, something I'd like to encourage you to try. We want everybody going home with the good message of the gospel and uh, not additional things. So. Um, as far as other announcements are concerned, if you look at the back of your bulletin and the inside back cover, you see upcoming events. I wanted to highlight in particular our Sunday morning adult forum series related to um, Rowan Williams' book, Being Christian. On Wednesday nights, soup, uh, supper in Brown Hall, a brief evening prayer, and then our usual program options, which the adult option is gonna be a series in the library on the study of the Gospels. So um, we can use volunteers to help with the soup suppers. There's a sign up uh, clipboard on the welcome table in the narthex. Um, one other item I wanted to mention that uh, somehow missed the bulletin, but a week from today in the afternoon, and the time is 3.30. 3.30. It is, uh, now it's totally escaped me. Soli Dale Gloria concert, but what's the, the Content. 3.30 next Sunday, Saint, uh, the Passion, St. John's Passion by Bach. So uh, should not be missed. Again, 3.30 here a week from today. I think that's it. Please stand as you are able. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who forgives all our sin, whose mercy endures forever. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things we have done and things we have failed to do. Turn us again to you and uphold us by your spirit so that we may live and serve you in newness of life through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Lord be with you. Lord God, our strength, the struggle between good and evil rages within and around us, and the devil and all the forces that defy you tempt us with empty promises. Keep us steadfast in your word, and when we fall, raise us again and restore us through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Sign language. A reading from Genesis. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to till it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you may freely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall die. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God say you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it or you shall die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. Word of God, word of life. Mercy embraces those who trust in the Lord. Mercy embraces those who trust in the Lord. Happy are they whose transgressions are forgiven and whose sin is put away. Happy are they to whom the Lord imputes no guilt and in whose spirit there is no guile. While I held my tongue, my bones withered away because of my groaning all day long. For your hand was heavy upon me day and night. My moisture was dried up as in the heat of summer. Mercy and grace. And I acknowledged my sin to you and did not conceal my guilt. 
I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. Then you forgave me the guilt of my sin. Therefore, all the faithful will make their prayers to you in time of trouble. When the great waters overflow, they shall not reach them. You are my hiding place. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way that you should go. I will guide you with my eye. Mercy and grace. Not be like horse or mule, which have no understanding, who must be fitted with bit and bridle, or else they will not stay near you. Great are the tribulations of the wicked, but mercy embraces those who trust in the Lord. Be glad, you righteous, and rejoice in the Lord. Shout for joy, all who are true of heart. Mercy embraces those who trust in the Lord. A reading from Romans. Just as sin came into the world through one man, and death came through sin, and so death spread to all because all have sinned. Sin was indeed in the world before the law, but sin is not reckoned when there is no law. Yet death exercised dominion from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sins were not like the transgression of Adam, who is a type of the one who was to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if the many died through the one man's trespass, much more surely have the grace of God. And the free gift in the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for the many. And the free gift is not like the effect of the one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation. But the free gift following many trespasses brings justification. If, because of the one man's trespass, death exercised dominion through that one, much more surely will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness ex exercise dominion in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, just as one man's trespass led to condemnation for all, so one man's act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all. For just as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. Word of God, word of life. Please stand as you are able for the reading of the gospel. Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was famished. The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, one does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, 
so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, again it is written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to him, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan. For it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil left him, and suddenly angels came and waited on him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. I'd like to invite the children to come forward for the children's sermon. Good morning. Good morning. Good to see you all. Got a loaf of bread here, right? Who can tell me what kind it is? Dark rye. Schwarzwälder, it says. Dark rye. So, when I talk to people that have moved to the United States from somewhere else, you know, there's often a list of things that they miss from somewhere else. But do you know what is almost always on that list of things that they miss? Bread. Bread is almost always on that list. Yesterday I heard a story on the radio about a Latvian man, and the whole story was about black rye bread from Latvia. The entire story, black rye bread. So I got some rye bread. This is not the kind of bread that I grew up on. Growing up in uh, suburban Chicago in the 1970s, we searched far and wide for the whitest bread you could possibly find. (laughs) And uh, that's what I was raised on. And, but it's amazing how this is such an important staple. It's like the important basic food that we often get used to is bread. And coming from different cultures, that bread may look a little different, but it's always bread. And when we look at the story about Jesus today, it's also about bread. Jesus hasn't eaten in several days, and he's being tempted with not ice cream, not a trip to Disneyland, he's being tempted with bread. Bread. And you would think Jesus would be hungry for bread. But in essence, what he says in the story is, I'm not hungry for bread. I'm hungry for God. And it's one of the things for us that we need to remember is sometimes what our world around us or sometimes maybe even our own stomach is telling us is the most important thing is actually not the most important thing. That God is the most important thing. And so Jesus experiences this in the wilderness We're not always in the wilderness when that happens, but we too also experience it. Let's say a prayer. Gracious God, we love our bread, but we love you more. Walk with us that we might draw close to you and away from the things of this life. Amen. I didn't mean to insult the one who can't eat bread, but that's... (laughs) I know one of our Finnish families here, after a couple of years of finally giving up and trying to find proper Finnish black bread, uh, learned how to make it himself (laughs) after a a region-wide search for it. The the readings that we have today are very familiar to us, and I want to mention one thing that's kind of strange about them. Normally, we have a gospel text where there is a familiar story to us, and we kind of know how the story goes, and there's something that we learn and glean from it. And if all goes well, the Old Testament reading, or what we might say with a large C, the complementary reading, complements that story in some fashion. 
Today, both of these stories work together very well. But most weeks then, the second reading, which comes from one of the letters, almost always from Paul, is a complete wild card and unrelated to anything. But instead, today, it is the perfect reading that weaves both of these texts, the Old Testament and the Gospel reading together, in a way that just really brings them to life. It is a story of Adam and Eve and Christ. The story is of how brokenness came to humankind through one person and how salvation comes to humankind through Christ. They are these parallel stories. I want to start by talking about the Gospel text a little bit. In this story, it's a familiar story to us, Jesus has just been baptized, and in the Gospel of this year, Matthew's Gospel, Jesus is led into the wilderness by the Spirit. I always feel like that's a confusing phrase there. As most of you well know, we love camping in the national parks and in the wilderness. It's not that wilderness. It's not a, oh, I have to go pick that thing up at REI before we go out to the wilderness. That's not the wilderness that's being referenced here. The wilderness that's being referenced is picture Tucson, but more heat, drier, less plants, right? It is a harsh, forbidding place of testing where not everything survives the testing. That is the wilderness that's being referenced here. Jesus is in the wilderness in this time of testing, and he is famished. We get this magical number of 40 days and 40 nights. Sometimes we have to look at the numbers in Scripture as almost more of like a color than a mathematical definition. This idea is that it is a, a long period of time. He is starving. Starving. And in the midst of that, the tempter comes and offers bread. Or suggests that Jesus could simply make bread, right? Not quite the same thing. Not quite the same thing. That's the Gospel text, the first part of the Gospel text. Let's go to the Genesis text. The Genesis text, as we hear in the second chapter, the second creation account, the Adam and Eve story, What's the context there? Is it wilderness? No. It's almost, what is like almost the opposite word you could possibly use from wilderness? Garden, right? They're in the Garden of Eden where everything is provided for them. Everything. They have no need and no want. God has cared for them in a way that eliminates all need. So if we have Jesus in the harsh wilderness, sun beating down on him, starving, Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, where they are brought together in a place that provides for all of their needs through God, not starving. In fact, might we say, full. Full. This is where the stories begin to diverge, right? They're both about, at least initially, food. This sense of, well, this fruit would be great to eat, wouldn't it? Do you notice how in the text there's no, but I'm full? <laughs> there's no, but I'm full. Isn't, isn't that maybe the human condition a bit? At least in our modern day and age? Think of almost any advertisement you've seen recently. Almost every single advertisement is encouraging you to consume something for which you are already full up. Already full up. Consume, consume, consume. Whether it is food or anything else, this image of consumption when we are already full. 
I think that's an interesting image for us when we compare it to the gospel text. It's broadened from just food. We remember the three different elements, right? We have the stones to bread. We have bringing Jesus to the holy city and putting him on the pinnacle of the temple and throwing himself off. The sense of all religious authority. And then being offered all the kingdoms of the world. All political authority could be his. Everything that one might crave. Everything that one might hunger for. Everything that as human beings we are coached to desire no matter how full we possibly are. There's always room for more, right? There's always room for more. One of the things that I think is kind of fascinating when we think about this idea of consumption is how we often can't ever get enough. When we moved back to the Midwest when I was just recently married, one of the places that we stopped was in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And we stopped and went to a typical Amish place for dinner. And it was interesting because I hadn't been back east in quite a while, and as a native son of the Midwest, putting potatoes and meat in front of me was a, was a, a strong, warm sense. And I didn't realize I was in trouble until the pause before the pie came around. Um, and what I recall distinctly was having a hard time getting my legs up high enough to get back into the car afterwards. I can't think of another time that that ever has happened in my life. Full beyond what is healthy and right, and yet consuming, right? As we get older, we learn to kind of consume the things that are more socially acceptable, like 60 plus hours a week at work is fine, but don't eat too much. Don't smoke, but stay away from your family while you work. All of these things have different social prices, and we become savvier as we move forward in life. But this idea of endless consumption that becomes all about living our lives in a way that is self-focused. What am I short of? And yet after every meal of whatever it might be, we still hunger for more. In Scripture, it's interesting, the expression is satisfied. It's as though we are never satisfied with what we consume. I've heard it expressed before in devotions as, as if there is a hole in ourselves as human beings that we are trying to fill with a million things, spending our life and labor on that goal, realizing that that hole will never be filled with anything but God. A God-sized hole, you might say. When we circle back around to the Gospel text, Christ is saying no in a way that says my focus is on God. My focus is to serve others. I am not getting into this wheel where it's all about what I can consume. I'm stepping out. I'm not playing that game so that I might be focused on what God has called me to be about. Now we might say, well, that's fine for Jesus because he's Jesus, right? The rest of us are not Jesus. And so how do we experience God's grace and hope in life in those moments when we feel the most tempted, when we are perhaps at our weakest. I have been using every morning the Wondrous Love Lenten devotional that we mailed out to you all, and it's been interesting to me to see the, how the passages correlate with our Sunday readings. This morning's scripture passage that was attached is this one, actually. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. 
Perhaps it's in those moments where we are tempted to consume endlessly on whatever the world has said will solve our problems. When we feel most weak and vulnerable, when we feel like the only path forward is to consume, that perhaps the grace of Christ comes to give us a different path, a path that is about orienting ourselves towards God and in doing so, orienting ourselves towards our neighbors. I would encourage you in this Lenten season to be mindful about the way in which the world around us pushes us to consume and how we might say no with Christ, even in our weakness, that we might turn towards God and serve our neighbors. Amen. Please stand as you are able. To God, who is gracious and merciful, we pray for the church, the world, and all who are in need. God of the wilderness, we pray for the church. Make your church holy ground where all people can be seen and loved for you, for who you have created them to be. Hear us, O God. We pray for creation. Forgive us for our desire to dominate creation instead of serving as faithful stewards and caretakers. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. We pray for the nations. Liberate leaders and governments from the temptation to exercise unjust dominion over those whom they are called to lead and serve. Hear us, O oh God. We pray for those in need. 
Sustain those who are hungry and alone, those who are anxious, those facing difficult decisions, and those facing a recent diagnosis or new grief. We pray especially for Carol and Andrew at the death of her mother, Maria, and for all those we name in our hearts or out loud now. Hear us, O oh God. We thank you for putting new songs on our lips and in our hearts. Hear our voices as we join in songs of lament and praise. We give thanks for musicians, composers, and poets. Hear us, O oh God. We praise you for bringing us through the desert into the promised land of your kingdom. We give thanks for saints who have guided us in times of trial and joy, especially for Maria. Hear us, O God. According to your steadfast love, O God, hear these and all our prayers as we commend them to you through Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. We will take a moment to share the peace with one another, and I encourage you to try and look cool and do a elbow bump.
God, our provider, you have not fed us with bread alone, but with words of grace and life. Let us at least your gifts, which we receive from your bounty, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ. You call your people to cleanse their hearts and prepare with joy for the Paschal Feast that renewed in the gift of baptism we may come to the fullness of your grace. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending
righteous God, in Jesus you were tempted to make stones into bread, but instead in him you make us living stones, and you make bread become his body. Send down your Holy Spirit on this bread and wine, that they become alive for us. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Justifying God, in your patience you see the hunger of your children. Send upon us your word, that in your living bread we may never be hungry again. In your glory you hear your fragile world's cries for justice. Shape us in the habits of faithfulness, the discipline of holiness, and the practice of peace, that we may find your justice as we walk with your Son on the way of the cross until that day when you surprise us in the joy of resurrection, one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, full of grace and truth. Amen. Our Father in heaven, As you come forward to receive the sacrament, you'll receive first the bread, you'll take a glass from the basket, the first assistant with the white chalice has wine, the second with the green chalice has grape juice. All is ready, all are welcome.
stand as you are able. Let us pray. Compassionate God, you have fed us with the bread of heaven. Sustain us with the eyes of the children. We are asking you to hunger for justice, our hopes to make you in peace. And our prayers will come from grateful hearts. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Now is the acceptable time. Now is the day of salvation. Holy God, speaking, spoken, and inspiring, bless you, unbind you, and send you in love and in peace. Amen. Amen. 